Hello and welcome to Telesur. This is from the south, from our studios in Caracas, Venezuela. I'm Carla Gonzalez. Let's begin with our stories. The trial of the Mexican drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman has completed its first day in New York City. Federal prosecutors say the presumed leader of the Sinaloa cartel shipped massive amounts of illegal drugs to the United States. El Chapo faces 17 criminal counts and a potential life sentence if convicted. The defense lawyers claim Guzman is a scapegoat and that the real leaders of the cartel are free in Mexico. Meanwhile, Guzman's lawyer has said that the Sinaloa cartel paid hundreds of millions of dollars in bribes to the current president of Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto, and the former president, Felipe Calderón. Via Twitter, Calderón denied these accusations and his involvement with the Sinaloa cartel, as we can see on the street. A spokesperson for the outgoing president, Peña Nieto, has denied the accusations as well. After breaking away from the main caravan in Mexico City, a group of migrants have arrived at the border city of Tijuana. They are planning to seek asylum in the United States. About 400 people have reached into the border with nine buses as the U.S. military reinforced security measures. And many more are expected to arrive in the coming days. Migrants say they are undeterred despite the hostile attitude of the Trump administration. In Texas, troops have begun to lay barbed wire at the border. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency has announced they will also close down lanes at the border crossing and set up barricades. This is all part of President Trump's zero tolerance on immigration, which includes sending nearly 15,000 troops to the border and suspending asylum requests for anyone who enters the country illegally. U.S. Secretary of Defense James Mattis is expected to visit the border area on Wednesday. Meanwhile, one of the caravans has arrived to the Mexican city of Guadalajara as they continue their journey. Our correspondent Pablo Perez has a story. Migrants heading north are trying to find transportation that can help them travel longer distances. The U.S. border is still far away, although there are people who don't want to cross it. They would rather stay in Mexico. There are jobs here and everything we need. They have even offered us residency. Many have accepted, but they still want to remain near the border. The organization People Without Borders is helping the caravan to remain safe during their 2,000-kilometer journey. Compañeros, compañeros, agárrense por favor, tengan mucho cuidado, acuérdense que la vida ante todo, por favor agárrense y cuídense compañeros, cuídense en el camino por favor, agárrense. Truck drivers often stop to pick up some of them from one town to the next one. I help them because I want them to fulfill their dream, to come out from poverty, even if it's a big risk to give them a ride in the back of a truck. Families also face a risk, especially with their children. I'd rather risk my life here with my family than live in Honduras with the crime and the leaders that rule our country. In this stretch of the road, they are walking a distance six times longer than they did in their first days. Thanks to a careful planning, the caravan has managed to reach Guadalajara, the country's second largest city. That was Paulo Perez following this migrant caravan. Military police now in Brazil have used force to try to break up a land occupation. About 100 police moved into the Novo Pindarim camp in the state of Piauí to evict 250 families who have been occupying the area for two years. At least one person was reportedly injured. In the last week, eviction orders have been issued against two other land occupations in Brazil. 
Meanwhile, social movements have taken to the streets to protest against a controversial law in Brazil that, if approved, would greatly censor topics discussed in schools. If the law is approved, teachers won't be able to use words such as oppression or gender, or even talk about political issues in the classroom. The law is currently being discussed in Congress. Earlier on Tuesday, a group of teachers and students were prevented from entering Congress to participate in this discussion. Democracy is being attacked. We couldn't get past here and enter the room where the debate is happening. Democracy is at risk. We came with representatives from teachers and student organizations, and we were prevented from entering. They don't want to give us the right to protest against something that for us represents a major attack. Now to Colombia. Audio recordings have been released accusing Attorney General Nestor Humberto Martinez of knowing about the Odebrecht bribery network since 2015. The information was revealed during an interview with a key witness in the corruption case, Jorge Enrique Pisano, who died a week ago. He said at the time that he had met the Attorney General back in 2015 and warned him of the bribery. At the time, Martinez was being considered for the position of Attorney General. And the Attorney General has rejected these accusations. In a public statement, Martinez said he did not inform the authorities about the bribes because Pisano was not sure that the bribery was even real. Coming up, we have more stories, but you can follow us. We're on Twitter at Telesur English and my account at Carla G. Telesur. So give us a follow. We'll be back. back. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister Keith Rowley has said the natural gas deal signed with Venezuela would usher in a new area in regional cooperation. Trinidad and Venezuela signed a major energy cooperation deal back in August. The United States, once a major importer of gas, is now a competing exporter. But the Caribbean can now become a major competitor. Mr. Luis Bertrand Rafikas. The Jagan deal is a prime example of the symbiotic relationship between Trinidad and Tobago and its nearest neighbor, Venezuela, and an indication of cooperation among neighbors, but more importantly, among two founding members of the GCF member countries. Additionally, the Caribbean region is becoming a hotbed for hydrocarbon exploration. Recent successes in exploration in Guyana has prompted interests in Suriname, Cuba, Barbados, Grenada, and Guyana. These countries can benefit from Trinidad's experience in the hydrocarbon arena, while providing opportunities for Trinidad and Tobago in many aspects of the hydrocarbon value chain. Let's hear more details about this agreement with our correspondent in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, the theme of this meeting could all be about change and adapting to change. 
with the United States moving from a major importer of natural gas to exporter and other shifts in the status quo, it means Trinidad now needs to figure out how to export gas to new countries. Now, some of those countries are in Asia or Africa, and that's, of course, much further away than the U.S., which means it's more expensive and more logistical to send it there. And the price of gas has not changed. And smaller countries like Trinidad and Tobago, though major exporters of natural gas, don't actually have a say in the actual setting of the gas prices. And that's why the Prime Minister called for more transparency in the way the price natural gas is set. Now, so for countries like Trinidad and Tobago, it's all about diversifying and adapting to this new natural gas world. That could mean becoming mentors, so to speak, of other emerging markets, like in Equatorial Guinea or Ghana in Africa, or even closer to home, Guyana or Grenada. And of course, there's climate change. Prime Minister Rowley, in his address, acknowledged the importance of climate change and the move to renewable energy. But remember, natural gas is still the country's bread and butter. So he hasn't been, and probably will not be, quick to condemn non-renewable energy. That was our correspondent, Kijan Hames. The Caribbean Court of Justice has ruled that a law in Guyana, which makes it illegal for any person to appear in public while dressed as the opposite sex, is unconstitutional. The ruling in this case was brought up by four trans women and the Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination. The court determined that the law was vague and violated the right to protection. Now let's talk about Peru. Members of the public health system have been on strike for six days after being repressed by security forces. Let's learn more. Peruvian security forces fired tear gas canisters and rubber bullets against public hospital workers, stopping them from getting near to the premises of the Ministry of Health. Workers have been on strike for six days without reaching an agreement with government officials. The government prioritizes political issues instead of prioritizing people's health. We will continue marching. We will discuss these issues in different meetings because we have the conviction within us. We are worthy and we deserve some respect. Delegations of hospital workers from across Peru have joined the strike in Lima. They set up tents outside the Ministry of Health where they plan to remain indefinitely until the government finds a solution for their demands. From Puno, the most forgotten region where anemia has increased by 73%, where there are 22 maternal deaths caused by pneumonia. From there, uh, we support this measure to show this government that we need some answers. We raise our voices and we'll continue fighting. Delegations from the north of the country have also arrived, expecting the government to deliver bonds that by law belong to the health workers for having worked in extraordinary conditions under the El Nino phenomenon of 2017. In Pura, we had had 547 health workers got sick with dengue. And even while carrying that sickness, we had to show up to work. We had three co-workers who died, two of them with dengue, and who was driving an ambulance when he was caught by a landslide. His body was never found. And the only thing the government has done is to declare him a national public health hero. These workers demand an increase in public health funds to get hospitals out of crisis. They also demand salaries increase and the hiring of 95,000 more workers under new agreements to give them work stability. And we'll keep on following that protest in Peru. We continue in the country. A court has rejected an appeal presented by opposition leader Keiko Fujimori against a judge who sentenced her to preventive detention. The judge said there is no real evidence or reason to prove that Keiko's case was not independent. Keiko Fujimori was sentenced to 36 months in jail for alleged money laundering. The former vice president of Ecuador, Jorge Glass, has announced that he will continue his hunger strike, adding that he won't even drink anything. He started a hunger strike 24 days ago for being transferred from a jail in Quito to a maximum security prison in Latacunga. According to Glass, this was a politically motivated move by the administration of President Lenin Moreno. He, Moreno, who is against former President Rafael Correa and members of his former government. Our correspondent in Quito, Denise Herrera, has more. 
Hello, yes, indeed, the Ecuadorian former Vice President Jorge Glass is on the 24-day of hunger strike. Uh, uh, he also started refusing to eat, not only to eat uh, food, but, only, uh, but also to eat uh, water. And in light of this, the Ombudsman's Office of Ecuador has published a report where they reject this measure and also are calling to the authorities to take responsibility of the situation of Jorge Glass inside the jail in La Tacunga. Also, uh, the judge of La Tacunga has rejected the action of Avias Corpus presented by the legal team of former, vice pre of former Vice President of Ecuador, Jorge Glass. Under this, his family and close friends of the, uh, the citizen revolution movement highlighted the irregularities inside this process and legal process against Jorge Glass. Now his legal defense team also are calling to the authorities to take again Jorge Glass to jail for where he started his legal process. It's all for now. Back to you at the studio. That was Anise Herrera from Quito. Now to Argentina, workers from the state-run airline are condemning a campaign by the government to privatize it. A representative from the pilots' union said the government of Mauricio Macri is trying to pit airline workers against the people, this by spreading fake news about their working conditions and wages. The union says these attacks are meant to help justify the adjustment measures imposed on the people by request of the International Monetary Fund. We'll take one last short break, but stay with us. Welcome back. Palestinian groups in Gaza have agreed into a joint statement to accept a ceasefire brokered by Egypt, Norway and the United Nations. However, they only agreed to halt the cross-border attacks that have intensified over the last 48 hours if the Israeli forces do the same. In Gaza, many Palestinians were out on the streets celebrating, claiming victory and handing out sweets to the crowd. Since the attack began on Sunday, at least 14 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli airstrikes and at least one Israeli by Palestinian counterattacks. People came out today because of the victory of the resistance factions and these people support it. We tell the resistance factions all the people are being you and this is victory of the Palestinians. We congratulate ourselves and we congratulate our people because we have this brave resistance faction which have proof and keep on providing every day that they are responsible and can repulse the aggression and rein it. Meanwhile, Israeli military forces have deployed tanks to the border with Gaza as a means of reinforcing their military presence in the area. This comes after Palestinian fighters responded to recent airstrikes with rockets fired into southern Israel. The Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum will take place in Papua New Guinea from the 17th to the 18th of November. The forum has been labeled the biggest event to be hosted in Papua New Guinea since its independence celebration in 1975. 
Leaders from 20 countries will be attending the meeting, including Chile's President Sebastián Piñera. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence will attend instead of President Donald Trump. But the star of the meeting seems to be China's President Xi Jinping. The visit of the President of China to Papua New Guinea is, uh, it, it, everyone's looking forward to it. Uh, it, it is so historic uh, to have the, uh, uh, the President visit and also because your President has a connection to Papua New Guinea with uh, a project that he was working on some time ago when he was uh, governor uh, up in the highlands. So he's, you know, it's really touching that he's familiar with Papua New Guinea already and the development challenges that we face. And I think people are just so extremely excited to, to know that he will be here soon. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has met with Sueda hostages that were freed from the Islamic State group. Assad received the group at the presidential palace in Damascus. Among them, 19 women and children who were freed by Syria's army. The southern city of Sueda is mainly populated by Druze people, a community threatened by the Islamic State group. A new Ebola outbreak has already killed more than 200 people in the Democratic Republic of Congo. According to the World Health Organization, this Ebola outbreak is expected to last until mid-2019. Dense and mobile local population, insecurity caused by two armed groups, and its spread by transmission in health centers makes it difficult to stop this disease. This outbreak is now the worst in the country's history. استقبل السيد الرئيس بشار الأسد مختطفي ريف السويداء of community members uh, both through mass mobilization techniques but also through individual house to house techniques and mobilizing community members themselves uh, increasingly we're looking at youth and women's groups including what's called the tante de rue the aunts of the street who are powerful local figures in neighborhoods who really actually form or help form public opinion so they're all being mobilized in response and we're starting to see some very positive signs if we so let's move to another story. Black Tunisians have welcomed the adoption of an anti-racist law by the country's parliament. Last month, Tunisia's parliament approved a landmark law penalizing the use of racist words, inciting hatred and discriminating on racial grounds. Despite abolishing slavery in 1846, black Tunisians, who are mostly descendants of slaves, continue to face frequent racism. People will say that there is no discrimination, but there is. People say there are no differences between a white person and a black person, but in reality it is the opposite. In reality, they despise you. The mentalities here are outdated. Now to Venezuela. The Minister of Industries and National Production, Tarek El Aysami, is on an official visit to Turkey as part of a bilateral cooperation strategy. El Aysami arrived to Ankara on Tuesday and held a meeting with Turkish Vi Vice President Fuat Oktay. Both sides praised the meeting and hoped to continue strengthening their ties. The Central Bank of China renewed a contract on currency swap with the Bank of England involving 50 billion U.S. dollars. The contract is aimed at maintaining the stability of the two countries' financial markets. This contract will be valid for three years, which could be extended with the concern of both parties, according to the central bank. Officials from the United Kingdom and the European Union have agreed on a draft text of the Brexit agreement after months of negotiations. Prime Minister Theresa May will be seeking the support of her ministers at a special cabinet meeting on Wednesday. She's currently meeting ministers one by one, as we can see, at Downing Street to brief them on the draft agreement. Will ministers back this deal, Chief Whip? We're going to stay in the customs union on this deal. We're going to stay effectively in large parts of the, of the single market. And uh, that means it's vassal state stuff. Uh, we are going to, for the first time in a thousand years, uh, this place, this parliament, uh, will not have a say over the laws that govern this country. It is a quite incredible state of affairs. It will mean that we are having to accept rules and regulations from Brussels over which we have no say ourselves. It is utterly unacceptable to anybody who believes in democracy. It is not the right way forward. And there is a kicker. 
And the kicker is that not only are we going to remain in the customs union and in large parts of the single market, uh, but also we will not have protected our precious union. Cambodia has broken a Guinness World Record for building the largest dragon boat. The boat is 83.3 meters long and 1.94 meters wide. It is made of hardwood with an artistic Khmer ancient design and it is capable of carrying 179 rowers. More than 14,000 Cambodians have taken almost 200 days to build this boat. The previous record was set by China in 2016. And that brings us to the end of this news brief. But as you know, this and other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. Here you can find all our latest information, especially on the case of El Chapo that we're following along and the migrant caravan that continues its way north. So be sure to like us on Facebook and to follow us also on Instagram. I'm Carla Gonzalez. Continue watching Telesur, connecting the global south. Until the next time.